Hello, my name is Kyle Harrington. I run the Facebook group Mechanics of Thought and the YouTube channel of the same name. Many of you might know that I wanted to put out some longer form content where we would discuss topical relevant issues and hopefully bring in some academic evidence and academic theories to see if we could shed light on some of the wider societal implications of, of recent developments. Um, so whether that's new technology, developments in politics, social media, and, and so on. That is something that I want to do, so if you're interested in, in getting involved or collaborating on that, then please do let me know. In the meantime, I wanted to just put out a video on decision making for a few reasons, really. Firstly, I think decision making is an interesting topic in its own right. I um, think it's interesting to understand the cognitive and psychological uh, mechanisms and factors that are, affect our decision making. Um, but I also think it's increasingly important as we move into the information age and um, the theories behind uh, theories and paradigms within decision making do end up being adopted by various uh, large scale actors, institutional actors, so um, social media companies, uh, governmental bodies, and so on. So it's, it is really important to be aware of this sort of stuff and some of the assumptions um, that, that shape our modern world. Um, and, and finally, decision making is also an area of my own academic interest. Uh, I completed a, a PhD in the decision making of missing person search not too long ago. Um, so it's something that I'm very personally interested in. Um, so I hope you enjoy this presentation. So I wanted to start really by discussing um, kind of bounded rationality view to decision making where people can be considered as logical agents each trying to maximize their own gains and, and minimize their own losses. Um, so one particular tool, a particular feature of this sort of view is it lends itself very well to, to game theory and game theoretical assumptions. So what is game theory? Well, game theory can be considered a set of mathematical models or a way of uh, conceptualizing the expected outcomes of a series of choices made by two or more rational strategists, each trying to maximize their own expected return. This way of conceptualizing fixed choices has a very long history, but became a particularly hot topic in around the 1950s after several major theoretical advances in the field. Two of the most well-known uh, theorists who advanced this sort of approach are the mathematician and computer scientist John von Neumann. Incidentally, John von Neumann was also um, very, very important for the development of the first uh, computer architecture, and, and some people will still refer to modern computers as von Neumann machines. The second person who you may have heard of is um, John Nash, whose life was fictionalized in the film A Beautiful Mind, where he was played by Russell Crowe for some reason. So um, just to give you some example of um, what Nash's contribution was and, and hopefully to illuminate what game theory is, um, this example is very often used. So. Um, as you can see here, we have a table, and the rows represent all the choices available to one person, and the columns represent all the choices available to another person, with the cells corresponding to the expected return of both people. So, in the prisoner's dilemma, um, it's a hypothetical scenario in which you and a co-conspirator were plotting against the government and you're captured and you're separated and you are interrogated separately with each person not knowing what the other person is going to choose. Now, you have two choices available to you. You can keep quiet and not reveal uh, your devious plot to the authorities and in doing so, cooperate with your co-conspirator, or you can tell all uh, and um, tell the authorities everything you know and defect to their side. And um, your, um, your co-conspirator has the same two choices. So that's what we can see here in the table. Cooperate with your co-conspirator 
or defect and tell everything to the authorities. So there are four potential outcomes of this. Uh, in the first one I'll talk about, where you both cooperate together, you both stay quiet, you both have three years in jail. In the second scenario, um, you uh, tell everything and you defect whilst your co-conspirator remains quiet. In that situation, with you defecting, you um, basically get uh, away with you, you get away with it, and your co-conspirator gets the full five years in jail. Um, if the situation is reversed and you keep quiet and he tells on you, you get five years and they go th uh, free. In the final scenario, where you both defect and you both tell all you both get one year in jail. Now, this is considered a Nash equilibrium point because it's the point of, it's a decision at which even if I were to know what you were to do, I wouldn't change my strategy. And you knowing what I'm going to do means that you won't change yours either. So this is what is considered a Nash equilibrium point. So to quickly see if a Nash equilibrium point exists, reveal each player's strategy to the other players. If no one changes their strategy, then the Nash equilibrium is proven. So this had some very profound implications for all areas um, of, of mathematics that, that draw on this sort of approach. So there are many different applications of, of game theory and the, the associated models from finance, video game design, war planning, robotics, and as a special case that we'll talk about evolution and evolutionary psychology. However, around the 1950s, um, a, a new approach started to emerge, which we'll call here the heuristics and biases approach. And this was really spearheaded by um, Kahneman and Tversky, who um, one was a psychologist and the other was a mathematician uh, e economist. And again, this started in the 70s. And Kahneman and Tversky basically said, hey, maybe people don't behave as um, rational agents who always seek to maximize their own gains, minimize their own losses, act with perfect knowledge, and so on. Human beings aren't like this model that we assume them to be, uh, the homo economicus model, as it were. Um, so this heuristics and biases approach, it, it has different names, but it really means the same sort of thing. You'll, you'll sometimes hear the term behavioral um, economics, uh, which is which is basically in this ballpark. So to talk about a few of the heuristics and biases here, uh, one I'll highlight is the availability bias. Um, so the salience of a memory can um, basically mean that that memory is easier to retrieve, uh, it's easier to recall, and we often base our estimates of prevalence on the ability of something to recall from memory. So to give you an example, if you were to watch a particularly horrible um, news article about a plane crash, and then somebody were to ask you how likely planes are to crash, um, the your ability to recall that salient event would probably make you think that they are more prevalent than they are. Um, two others I wanted to um, leave as a little um, puzzle for the, the uh, viewer. Um, the first one, and this is mentioned in the books quite a lot, is a bat and a ball cost £1.10 together. The bat costs £1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, I know what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're thinking, but no, it's not 10p. Um, this is an example of a substitution bias, as Kahneman and Tversky would call it. Um, you're... you're there is a solution which is relatively straightforward to, to work out, but your brain keeps on telling you 10p um, because the uh, easier question for you to answer is the difference between £1.10 and £1, even though that's not what you're being asked. And uh, that's one way in which your, your brain can fall for, for certain cognitive tricks, as it were. And the second one here, 
Um, Linda is 31 years old, uh, single, outspoken and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which is more probable? That Linda is a bank teller? Or that Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement? A considerable amount of people will go for the second option that Linda is a bank teller and active in the, sec uh, in the feminist movement. This is what Kahneman and Tversky would call a uh, representativeness bias. We think that Linda's description is representative of her being uh, a feminist. However, there is something um, very illogical about choosing the second option, and that is to do with compound probabilities. So. Whenever you have one event, um, however probable or improbable it is that Linda is a bank teller, when you compound that and, and add that to um, uh, Linda is active in the feminist movement, that likelihood is always going to be lower. It's always going to be less likely that two um, probable events will occur than uh, a single one on its own. A fallacy of conjunction, as it's called. Um, but even some very educated people fall for some very simple tricks like this. And all of this work really led to um, what Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for. Even though a lot of Kahneman and Tversky's work was, was done together, I would say most of it, unfortunately, Tversky passed away before the Nobel Prize was awarded, which can't be awarded posthumously, so went to um, Kahneman alone. Now, this is prospect theory. Um, and just to give you some uh, explanation here, um, on the x-axis there, we basically have the monetary value of uh, a certain amount, and on the y-axis there, we have the subjective feeling of that monetary value. So, there were two salient points about this graph, and the first point is that the positive and negative aren't uh, equal. They're not equal mirror mirrors of each other. So what this means is that we don't feel foregone gains as much as we feel losses. If I were to tell you that um, you just missed out on the opportunity to win £100, even if you knew that that was certain, it wouldn't feel as bad to you as you have just lost £100. There are many experiments, fixed choice experiments, that, that demonstrate this. The second point is that um, we don't consider every pound or, or every dollar to be equal. Um, so we would consider the difference between zero and five pounds as, as a much greater amount than the difference between 95 and 100 pounds, even though that's not always strictly rational to do so. So let me just give you an example of this that, again, is often brought up in the literature. If you were to go to buy a calculator from town uh, and the shop clerk were to say to you, I shouldn't be telling you this, but this £10 calculator that you're about to buy will be half price tomorrow and it will be £5. Would you go back the next day or buy it then and there? Now, a considerable amount of people will uh, say that under that hypothetical scenario, they will go back uh, to save the money and, and go into town and buy the calculator the next day. However, if you were to ask the same people the question, there is, uh, uh, you are going to buy a car that is £10,000. If you come back tomorrow, the car will be £9,995. Very few people will actually go back the next day because we're thinking of the saving in proportion to the car. But in both instances, the net result is the same. Go into town tomorrow and save yourself five pounds. It doesn't matter where that five pounds is, is saved from. And lots of people make that same basic mistake in their everyday lives. So back to the, um, the graph here. If this were um, describing strictly logical behavior, um, it should be a straight line um, between minus 100 and plus 100. But 
clearly that's not how human beings work. So I'd say in around the 2010s, you had a whole host of um, popular literature, podcasts, and, and this sort of behavioural economics approach really became quite mainstream, um, notably with Freakonomics, uh, the book, and the podcast. And um, in Freakonomics, they invited many of these sorts of people onto their show. Um, I mentioned Kahneman before, but the book Thinking Fast and Slow uh, is really a bit of a summary of uh, his life's work with Tversky and worth reading. It's, it's a bit simplified compared to some of his academic work, um, but it's a uh, it's very interesting read. Uh, there are also a few other books, like uh, Dan Airely is in a similar vein, uh, predictably irrational. Um, super forecasting, I would say, is, is slightly different to some of the, the others in the behavioral economics approach, but it definitely falls under that umbrella. And one that I wanted to single out for some special treatment was Thaler and Sunstein's uh, Nudge. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. What I will also say here is that... Um, the UK government uh, set up an independent, uh, that well, they set up a group called uh, the Nudge Unit, which then became the Behavioural Insights Team, looking to apply some of the findings from this sort of decision-making behavioural economics area into public policy. Um, they've since become independent from the government, but that really gives you just an idea of um, how these theories and assumptions can influence our everyday life and, and why I think it's something to be aware of. So I said I would come back to Nudge. Nudge kind of follows on from some of the, the earlier work in uh, behavioural economics and Thaler and Sunstein's basic argument is, hey look, people behave in some quite irrational and silly ways and they don't always make the sorts of choices that we think are appropriate what is to be done and they basically advocate a view called libertarian paternalism um which which certainly has some uh some implications that it's not stating um but the basic idea is this we don't want to limit people's choices if we can help it but people don't always make the choices we think are good so let us shepherd them uh to make better decisions and um, let's let's see if we can slightly change the outcome en masse of decision making in general. And that does sound a bit creepy and but there are some benign examples of, of where I think this could actually help quite a lot of people. Um, I think a good argument put forward by Thaler and Sunstein in the book is that um, there are many times where we want to give people choices uh, and that's perfectly normal but when we do so we always assume that um, we aren't influencing people as if there's some neutral choice architecture that you can present to people and Thaler and Sunstein say hey wait a minute no there is never a neutral choice architecture your ordering matters the information people have um, going in beforehand matters. The assumption of a default choice also influences people's decisions. So rather than pretending that um, decision architects don't have any bearing, they need to fess up to what they're doing, own up to it, and take some responsibility for the way that choices are presented to people. And I think that is quite compelling. Um, but we'll discuss uh, a completely different view now, which is naturalistic decision-making. And this sort of approach uh, was really spearheaded by, by one man in particular, and that is Gary Klein. Now, Gary Klein, I would say, has a much more optimistic view about human nature. He's not one of the strict rationalists of, of the uh, kind of game theory, bounded rationality approach that I mentioned before, but nor is he somebody that thinks that humans are prone to all sorts of uh, biases and bad thinking and, and horrible errors. 
Um, Gary Klein's naturalistic model of decision making is really concerned with uh, people in situ, in complex real world environments with impartial information. Um, so just to give you some idea, he started his work and is, is most famous for looking at the split second decisions of emergency firefighters. Um, they don't have time to think about all possible options. They don't tend to fall for some of these silly tricks and, and biases. Um, on the whole, they're quite effective at what they do. And, and that's basically Klein's argument here. So it's, it's, a, it's a much different perspective. Um, so his main model of decision making is called the recognition primed model of decision making and he says well when we speak to people what they tend to tell us that happens is that when they see a novel environment that they have not experienced before they um, see if they can form a mental simulation of what's going on and in that mental simulation they try to um, basically run a series of actions through that simulation uh, and then they compare what they expect the response to be and modify their behavior along the way until they get a response that they deem to be appropriate and then they'll act on it. Uh, and, and this is um, not a systematic brute force computation of all the possible outcomes. It's dependent upon expertise and familiarity. Um, so Gary Klein, I would say, uh, really does put a lot of stock in uh, expert decision making in complex environments with impartial and imperfect knowledge. Klein is also very interestingly an outspoken critic of all sorts of things that Kahneman and Tversky and the rest of the behavioral economists call uh, biases and heuristics. So in particular, he takes aim at confirmation bias. He says that it's supposed to describe a whole bunch of disjointed things that, that it doesn't really. Um, he also says that from a practical perspective, people can't go around questioning um, their everyday fundamental assumptions all the time when they have real world practical problems to answer. So we don't have to go about and, and prove that two plus two equals four before we go and do um, complicated algebra or, or use that same mathematics to, to do our scientific theory. So Klein basically says, hey, it's, it's completely normal that people take for granted what has served them well in the past and it's completely rational to do so also. So this um, paper here which talks about some of Klein's views, I thought I'd share it with you because it's somewhat of a, a summary of, of what Klein thinks here. Um, he says there's a real irony here. One of the primary biases is confirmation bias, the search for information that confirms your hypothesis, even though you'd learn more by searching for evidence that might disconfirm it. The confirmation bias has been shown in many laboratory studies and has not been found in a number of studies conducted in natural settings. That is a key difference there. Um, yet one of the most common strategies of scientific research is to derive a prediction from a favorite theory. Uh, and test it to show that it's accurate, thereby strengthening the reputation of that theory. Scientists search for confirmation all the time, even though philosophers of science, such as Karl Popper, have urged scientists instead to try to disconfirm their favorite theories. Uh, researchers working in the heuristics and biases paradigm condemn this sort of bias in their subjects, even as those same researchers perform more laboratory studies confirming their theories. And I think that is uh, a really interesting point, and the article itself is, is worth reading. Um, Klein's point here is that if you are looking for confirmation bias everywhere, well, no surprise, you will find it. So there's a delicious bit of irony in, in some of the exchanges going on here. So let's just compare some of the uh, three approaches that I've mentioned so far. Um, so rational decision making or homo economicus assumes that rational agents behave in ways to maximize their expected returns. Uh, I would say that this is one of those things that um, 
everybody implicitly believes, but nobody really would put forward to endorse that humans actually behave like that, even if we might use it as a simplified um, version, version in some of our models. So it's often used in game theory, um, economics, artificial intelligence, politics, logistics, and evolutionary theory. Um, the evidence for this, again, tends to be mathematics, computer models, and um, there is some um, evidence in evolutionary biology, arguably. Um, some of the strengths are that it's easy to model and it can apply to nearly everything because it's easy to model, well, because you can always write a computer program that's going to look for the maximum value of something and so on. Uh, criticisms as applied to a decision-making context, a cognitive science context, is humans aren't always strictly rational, nor are they in pursuit of, uh, nor are they in possession of perfect knowledge. Um, I would say that, that it's endorsed by, implicitly at least, classical economists, egoists within ethics, uh, realists within international relations, um, who see the state as a, a rational, self-maximizing agent, and certain strains of evolutionary psychology. The heuristics and biases approach basically says, hey, humans can fall for some very obvious tricks because their brains take shortcuts. It's often used in psychology, economics, um, it's used by social media companies and marketing companies in particular. There is a pretty good wealth of evidence for this sort of um, this approach, but it's typically derived from forced choice experiments in laboratory settings, um, also experiments on social media, where there are discrete possible outcomes. Um, and th there is uh, quite a lot of evidence there. Some of this evidence can be applied with varying degrees of success. Um, however, some of the criticisms of this approach are hey, maybe we're only really discussing uh, certain marginal fringe cases that aren't in a true context. Uh, if you can trick somebody in some uh, contrived laboratory uh, condition, are you really showing anything that profound about um, decision-making in general? One of the other criticisms is I think some of the um, views that spring out of it um, can be slightly deceptive and or controlling. And I would include uh, libertarian paternalism and a nudge and some of the findings and, and the assumptions in heuristics and biases research also have led to things like, um, you know, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and using social media in ways to influence people um, covertly and without their knowledge. Um, so typically the, the advocates for this sort of approach, as mentioned before, free economics and the, the behavioral economist crowd, the surveillance capitalists in a Zuboff sense, um, and that's social media giants, YouTube, Google, Amazon, and all the rest of it, uh, and behavioral psychologists in general uh, lean on this sort of approach. Uh, finally, naturalistic decision making is a bit more optimistic, as mentioned. Uh, people use their previous experience to apply contextual relevant knowledge. It's often used in human factors research, sometimes accident um, research or incident research, uh, workplace training, emergency services, and um, it's used to understand split-second decision-making. Um, much of the evidence does tend to be through expert interviews or observational studies of people at work and less uh, in a controlled laboratory environment. And I think the in situ aspect is a real strength of the approach here. However, I think it's unlike some of the other two where we can definitively come down one way or the other with hard um, quantitative data. I think this is a bit more hard to falsify. If I'm being honest, the, the approach overall it's not clear to me what it would take for it to be shown to be incorrect. Um, however, it still has quite a lot of supporters. Um, the US military, that's both the Army and the Navy, have been very keen on this uh, naturalistic decision-making. Um, it's very popular in America in general. 
Um, NASA, for example, are very keen on naturalistic decision-making approaches, as well as large-scale organizations like healthcare and so on. I wanted to talk about this paper as well, which is um, a really interesting discussion of the differences between the two approaches, the heuristics and biases and naturalistic decision-making. And this one was uh, actually written by Kahneman and Klein together after a uh, years of email correspondence between them. And what's interesting to me about this is that whilst they're complete diametric opposites in, in terms of uh, their, their views, they don't really disagree on some of the fundamental facts about the situation. It's more a difference in emphasis or a difference in perspective rather than it is a, a factual agreement about human nature. Um, so I think this this paper is worth a read if you're interested in these sorts of topics. So, is it really irrational, this heuristic and bias approach more generally? I'm going to say that within an evolutionary context, not necessarily, because evolution cannot really evolve your um, particular responses to particular things that you see in your environment. Instead, um, broad strategies tend to be selected for. So heuristics can be considered adaptive strategies, which evolved in tandem with other fundamental psychological mechanisms, and therefore must have been selected for. The survivability of these mechanisms demonstrate that um, heuristics overall have been beneficial to human reproductive success and the species overall. But it should not be surprising that some generalizations might be suboptimal or marginal in otherwise scientifically contrived cases. Um, so if you were to see um, a visual illusion, um, you might come to the conclusion that, hey, my, uh, that my, my visual system uh, is a bit crap, it gets caught out, it doesn't work the way that I, th I think it should do. Um, but that doesn't, uh, you being caught out by a visual illusion doesn't prove that your visual system is um, irrational. It proves that, hey, sometimes it's just more convenient to take shortcuts, even though that will show up. So you could argue that some of these cognitive biases and heuristics are similar to visual illusions. They are cognitive illusions that, that show us um, certain insights into cognitive strategies that have been selected for. So we said that I'd, I'd mention evolution again, and just to really hammer home that point, that evolution selects for strategy, not individual responses to contrived circumstances. So you can have a strategy that is overall a very good one, even if it fails, in some limited circumstances, it will still be selected for over time. And I really wanted to bring in um, the notion of peak shift by Ramachandran. And for a few reasons here, I think peak shift shows us very interest, something very interesting about how our perception works and how some of these um, seemingly irrational strategies um, are selected for and actually serve us quite well overall. So, um, Ramachandran, who is a neurologist, asked the question, hey, why does a picture of Richard Nixon look more like Richard Nixon than Richard Nixon does? Which is a great question. And part of the reason for that is because you've basically taken the average face, you've compared it to Richard Nixon, and then you've exaggerated the difference between Richard Nixon and the average face. So it's, it's a more concentrated form of him. But Ramachandran goes further and says that that is how our whole visual perception works. Um, we are drawn to caricature. He says that um, that explains why the peacock's tail has grown so large, because the peahen is looking for the most peacocky peacock because of a quirk of her visual perception 
uh, and in this way he ties in sexual and natural selection together. Um, some experimental evidence for this, which is um, pretty interesting, is um, when rats, I think that no, I think they were mice. When, when mice were exposed to um, two stimuli, the first was a square and the second was a rectangle, and they associate, they were rewarded whenever they touched the rectangle. Um, once they had that trained in, there was a second study where the original square was removed, the rectangle they'd been trained on had stayed, but then was introduced a more rectangular rectangle, a longer, thinner rectangle. Now, when the rodents go back in, instead of choosing the stimuli, uh, stimulus they've been trained on, they choose the untrained stimuli, uh, stimulus. Um, because what they've actually learnt isn't uh, a preference for, for that rectangle in particular. What they've learnt is a preference for rectangularity. That seemingly irrational action um, kind of makes sense in a broader evolutionary context. Uh, and, and the same might be true of our tendency for um, heuristics and biases. Finally, I wanted to just um, bring this non-zero in by Robert Wright because I think it ties in together a, a few things that have been discussed here. I will say that um, I do quite like this book, but it is a bit out there. Robert Wright is a scientific journalist, um, not a scientist per se, although he has written a few books in evolutionary psychology um, and he, he is known of. Um, in, in this book, Non-Zero, Robert Wright basically says that evolution, um, and whether that's by biological or, or cultural selection, tends towards increasing complexity and greater rewards for cooperation. So, like many others who investigate um, evolutionary psychology, he uses uh, a game theoretical approach to investigate tendencies in evolution which favour the, the existence of certain processes over others and argues that non-zero sumness will increase over time. Um, whether or not, not that's something you agree with, I, I think it's an interesting point. Um, so, the, the basic idea is that um, human, like, and from a cellular level, you start getting um, at the very dawn of, um, you know, the primordial soup, um, you start getting individual cells that work together because there are benefits. It's a non-zero sumness about their cooperation together where they both stand to benefit and over time that in, um, complexity increases and the same on a societal level with moving from kind of small kin group, family groups, kin groups um, to villages, complex towns, empires and, and, and nation states and, and all the rest of it. So I think I will just leave that there and again I do want to make um, more long form content in the future, but maybe a bit more conversational and less like a lecture. So if you're interested in getting involved, please do let me know. Thank you.